Let me uh, begin by thanking the organizers of this conference uh, for what has been a fascinating day of presentations thus far. Um, I don't know whether I can keep that record going, but we'll see. I feel like I need to begin, um, and I'm going to ask Jana not to count what I'm about to say against my time. So I feel like I need to introduce myself. Uh, as was noted, my name is David Campbell, and I teach at the University of Notre Dame which means that audiences often think that I am Catholic, but I am not. And I think I can safely say to this crowd that I'm a Mormon. <laughs> but you know, when you're a political scientist, this um, an occupational hazard of my profession is that you're occasionally asked to speak about elections. And so a few years ago, I was asked to sit on a round table at Notre Dame on Catholics in American politics. So I've disclosed one thing about my bio biography to you. Let me disclose another. I'm actually not an American. I'm a Canadian. <laughs> I didn't get quite the response from that one that I did from the Mormon <laughs> disclosure. But anyway, I went to this uh, little round table, you know, the sort of thing colleges do, and I said to the group of students assembled there, well, you know, the thing you should know about me is that I'm neither an American nor am I a Catholic, but I'm going to tell you about Catholics in American politics. And so if you want to hear what a non-Catholic, non-American has to say about that subject, stick around. Ha, ha, ha. That was my excuse for a joke. Um, well, the next day in the campus newspaper, the front page story went like this. Yesterday, Professor David Campbell, neither a Catholic nor an American, said da 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 <laughs> So I, I feel like I'm always the fish out of water, and maybe even more so today, because unlike the others who have spoken today, I am not a historian. I'm a political scientist. So what I'm going to be talking about today is some data um, from contemporary Mormons. So these are going to be quantitative empirical results from uh, two national surveys, one of the American population in general, uh, it's called the Faith Matters Survey. It was the source of data for a book that I published a little over a year ago with Robert Putnam of Harvard entitled American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us, available in paperback in just two weeks. Um, <laughs> what you should know about this survey is that it was big and that it is representative of the entire American population, which includes, of course, Mormons, but it means that I can compare Mormons to members of other uh, religions, and I'll be doing that. And um, even though our book actually deals with data from 2006 and 2007, we've actually gone back to those same people. We've interviewed them again in 2011. That's the data that I'll be showing here today. I'll also be showing you, for the first time ever, you are the first audience ever to hear about these results. I'll be reporting on what we call the Peculiar People Survey. This was a study done of just Mormons. I did it in collaboration with uh, John Green at the University of Akron and Quinn Monson at Brigham Young University. Uh, this is a representative sample of 500 Mormons, a survey conducted um, just a few weeks ago, beginning in the end of December, uh, spanning into early January. And, and um, even though I will not here be talking about the data from this recent survey that the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life did on Mormons. Uh, both John Green and I um, were consultants on that study, and I can assure you that the results from the study I'm going to be showing you today actually match the Pew results exactly. In fact, it's almost uncanny how close we are to the results that they have. Let me begin with just sort of a whimsical observation, a question we threw in our survey that we thought was kind of fun. Um, we asked, again, this, this is Mormons themselves, do you agree with the statement that Mormons are correctly described by the biblical phrase, quote, a peculiar people? And as you can see, um, roughly 80% of Mormons are more than happy to refer to themselves as peculiar. So for those who may not be LDS in the audience, I assure you that when we refer to Mormons as a peculiar people, we are not saying anything pejorative. If anything, Mormons love it. <laughs> so we'll be talking about that. What I want to talk about today, though, is uh, Mormon political mobilization and the factors that lead to it. And I'd like to introduce a metaphor. The metaphor is that Mormons are like dry kindling. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that Mormons can be rapidly and intensely mobilized into politics in the same way that if you drop a match onto kindling, it can ignite quickly. However, this 
only happens rarely. Indeed, it can only happen rarely because if these efforts at mobilization were frequent, they would cease to be effective. There are some pre-existing conditions for the political mobilization of Mormons. Mormons are, and this is how I'll structure the rest of my remarks, Mormons are conservative. I'll show you some evidence about that. Presumably, that's not gonna come as a shock to anyone in the crowd, but I'll show you some evidence on it nonetheless. However, Mormons are also distinctive in some very interesting ways. So they do not look like all the other conservatives in America. And on a few issues, they're very distinctive, and I'll talk about that. Mormons are also very active. They're very active in their faith, and I'll show you some evidence on that. And that's important because activity in a church, and this is not unique to Mormonism, it's true of religions in general, activity in a church lays the groundwork, it establishes the networks, it gives people the skills that enables them to be mobilized into politics. It turns out that trying to get a large number of people out to a park to clean it up looks a lot like trying to get a large number of people out to a caucus or to put lawn signs on people's yards during a political campaign. Um, and finally, Mormons are cohesive, which is an important element also of understanding um, the political profile of American Mormons. So let me just begin uh, with the fact that Mormons are conservative, something I'm going to bet is not terribly controversial, but nonetheless um, worth noting. Um, what you're looking at is a slide that compares uh, various religious traditions in America, Mormons at one end, um, but it also includes evangelicals and black Protestants and Catholics and Jews. Um, and this is just the percentage Republican. And as you can see from this slide, uh, Mormons are the most Republican religious group in the country. They edge out evangelicals by just a hair. It's also true that Mormons are the most likely to describe themselves as very conservative. We gave people a range of options. Um, but I want to note that even though they are the most likely to describe themselves as very conservative, it's not everyone. Okay? Now, if we added in the percentage you just say plain old conservative, that's going to be a higher bar. But I focus on the very conservative just to make the point, and this will be a recurring theme throughout these remarks, there is a strain of moderation and pragmatism within the Mormon population that should not be lost in any discussion of their political profile. Okay, so there's some evidence Mormons are conservative, no shock. But let me show you some ways in which Mormons are distinctive. Well, they're distinctive in a conservative way on some issues. So this shows you uh, the percentage of Americans who say it is better for a household if the, if the wife stays home and the husband is the breadwinner. The other option being that the husband and wife both work and share um, responsibilities at home. So this is the percentage who choose the more conservative or traditionalist option. It's better if women do not work. And you can see that Mormons are very distinctive on this issue. That Mormons are much more likely to say that it is better. That doesn't mean that they themselves necessarily have that family relationship. This question asks them, what do you think is the ideal situation? And Mormons are the most likely to say that it's, well, it's better, actually, for everyone involved if women don't work. So there's a conservative example of how Mormons are distinctive. Another one that I suppose you'd characterize as conservative, certainly it's interesting, is on our survey of just Mormons now, we asked a question of whether you believe the United States Constitution is divinely inspired. And we were showing you the percentage who strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree with that statement. And you can see that 70% of, Ameri of, of American Mormons believe that the U.S. Constitution, they strongly agree that the U.S. Constitution is divinely inspired. Um, add in the 20% who agree, and you get near unanimity on that question. That sort of fits in with Professor Barlow's uh, remarks just uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so those are two examples of, eh, these are ways that we see the distinctiveness of Mormons on the right. But it turns out that on some other issues, Mormons are distinctive in ways that do not necessarily fall in line with the right wing of American politics. On immigration, Mormons, while not the most pro-immigrant group in America, are far more supportive of, positive toward immigrants than are other conservative groups like the evangelicals. So this uh, question again comes from our survey of the entire U.S. population. We ask people to make a trade-off. Do you think it's better for us to increase immigration or should we, should we decrease it? This just shows you the percentage 
who say that immigration should be increased. It's interesting that none of these numbers are terribly high. But Mormons are uh, far more likely than evangelicals to say that, yes, we should have more immigration. Um, and the only group that, that they sort of come close to are really Jews. Jews are a little more likely to support immigration. Um, and, but of course, politically, Jews look a lot different in many other respects from Mormons. Um, I'll skip over that. Uh, more evidence that Mormons are conflicted on immigration on our survey of Mormons only. We asked um, Mormons to place themselves on a continuum. So they could either say that, well, immigrants strengthen our country, they could say that immigrants are a burden, or they could pick some point in between. And this uh, shows you that, well, it's kind of an even mix across those four options. It's not like Mormons cluster on one side of that question versus another, which suggests that when it comes to immigration, uh, Mormons are conflicted, perhaps. I'll skip over that one. On the question of gay marriage, this is one that is of uh, interest to a lot of audiences, given uh, the LDS Church's high profile on the question of same-sex marriage. We asked, again, on the survey of all Americans, a question that allowed people to express their opinion on gay marriage with a variety of options. So, you could say that you didn't think there should be gay marriage or civil unions, that is no legal recognition of homosexual relationships. You could take a middle ground and say no to gay marriage, but yes to civil unions. Or you could say yes to gay marriage. Okay, does that make sense? If you add up the two categories that oppose gay marriage, that is, no gay marriage, no civil unions, plus those who say no gay marriage, but civil unions are okay, Mormons are the most likely to oppose gay marriage. Okay, so by that definition, Mormons are the most likely. That's the overall height of the bar you're looking at. But that white part of the bar versus the purplish part of the bar, the white part of the bar, that's the percentage of Mormons who say that civil unions are okay. Look how large that is. That's a big chunk of the uh, Mormon population more evidence that actually the plurality of Mormons support the middle ground on gay marriage comes from our survey of Mormons only. We asked exactly the same question, and as you can see, it's the middle category where Mormons are most likely to cluster. This is evidence, again, of that moderate, pragmatic element of Mormonism. On abortion, Mormons are also very distinctive. If you characterize someone who opposes abortion under all circumstances or opposes abortion except for cases of rape, incest, and where the mother's health is in jeopardy. Okay, and that's actually the, when most politicians describe themselves as pro-life, that's what most of them would, would take as their position, that they would permit abortion under the, what are sometimes called the big three exceptions. Um, if you add those two together, Mormons look pretty pro-life, right? So they're about on par with evangelicals, they're about on par with Catholics. But note again the difference between the white chunk of the bar and the purplish part of the bar. The purplish part of the bar is the percentage of Mormons or any other group who oppose abortion under all circumstances. That is the most ardent, fervent pro-life stance. Very, very few Mormons take that position. Most Mormons say, well, abortion in general ought not to be permitted but I'm willing to allow it in the cases of rape, incest, and where the mother's health is in jeopardy. Now, why would Mormons say that? It's because that is the actual, I'm not going to say doctrine of the church, but it's definitely the practice of the church or the policy of the church is not actually to take the hardline pro-life position like, for example, the Catholic Church does, but instead to generally discourage strongly abortion, but nonetheless permit it in a few uh, extreme cases. Just to show you some more evidence of this, this is the percentage of Mormons um, who, when given a series of circumstances, would you permit abortion under this circumstance, under that circumstance, who say that abortion should be permitted when the mother's health is in jeopardy or when the pregnancy is a result of rape. It's almost unanimous. Almost all Mormons agree that abortion should be permitted under those circumstances. And I just wanted to compare Mormons to uh, the black bars, the US population in general. The gray bar, Catholics, the white bar, evangelicals. Um, on those two circumstances, Mormons are actually more willing to approve of abortion than the population as a whole, 
and certainly more than Catholics or evangelicals. But not under any other circumstances. You asked about whether there's a serious defect with the baby. Yeah, about 30% of Mormons say, well, okay, we'll accept abortion under those circumstances. Ask, um, should abortion be permitted if uh, the woman is poor? That's the, what's marked as low income. Uh, very few Mormons would approve of abortion in that circumstance. What if the woman just wants an abortion for any reason? No. What if she's married but doesn't want any more children? No, or very few. What if the woman isn't married? That's her reason for wanting an abortion. Um, and in all those cases, we see that Mormons are less likely to approve of abortion than are the US population as a whole, Catholics or evangelicals. That's all evidence that Mormons are distinctive in some interesting ways. Mormons are also highly active. How active are they? This graph shows you the percentage of Mormons who attend church weekly, that's the purplish bar, pray daily or read, read scripture daily, and it compares the percentage of Mormons who do those things versus other groups, and you can see that in every case, Mormons are more likely to attend church, to pray, and to read scriptures daily. Um, this extends to all sorts of things. I'm running short on time, so I won't be able to go into all that much detail, but it's true for religious volunteering, that is in Mormon parlance, holding a calling. It's true for financial contributions to the church, tithing. Mormons are just more likely to do this stuff than are members of any other religious tradition in America. However, and this is important to note, under normal circumstances, Mormons participate in politics at about the same rate as everyone else. This graph shows you a number of forms of political activity, whether you vote in local elections, whether you've contacted government, whether you've attended a rally, and Mormons don't leap out as being especially high or especially low. So a lot of community involvement, not just in their church, but also in their communities, that's important to note, but not a particularly distinctive group politically when it comes to their activity. So they're out there, they're doing stuff, but not necessarily more than other groups under normal circumstances. Mormons are cohesive. Lots of evidence of this. Mormons are uh, the most religiously insular group in the country, much more likely to have neighbors, friends, family members of the same religion. Um, this graph compares um, Mormons to other groups on a measure of religious bonding, we call it, that Bob Putnam and I use. You can see uh, if you're above that white bar, you're above the national average in your bonding. And Mormons, well, they're not only above the bar, they're really close to black Protestants and they fall a little behind Latino Catholics. Let me repeat that. Blacks and Latinos bond. You can perhaps appreciate why an ethnic group would do that. At almost the same rate that Mormons do, a religion that is not ethnic in its composition. Um, let me just give you another example of Mormon bonding, and I love to point this out to audiences. Um, on our big study that Bob Putnam and I did, we asked people how they perceive other religions. We use a thing called the feeling thermometer. This is a score between 0 and 100, how you feel about another religious group. The white bar is how a group, Mormons, Jews, Catholics, how they feel about themselves. The purplish bar is how everybody else feels about them. <laughs> For no group is there a wider division between how the rest of the country sees them. Mormons are not the least popular group in America. If you're a Mormon right now, you should be saying, thank goodness for the Muslims and the atheists. <laughs> but Mormons like themselves more than any other group likes themselves. More than Jews like Jews, more than blacks like blacks, more than Latinos like Latinos. That's a remarkable fact. <laughs> but are Mormons mobilized into politics? Remember I said their general level of political activity is actually pretty low. And when you ask a question about whether you get politics at church, and again, to a Mormon audience, what I'm about to say, completely non-controversial. To a non-Mormon audience, I have been hammered on this again and again. People just don't want to believe it. Well, if you ask, do you hear about politics at church or at least over the pulpit, Mormons say no. No religion has all that much religion at church, or politics at church. Mormons have virtually none, at least official politicking over the pulpit. 
or voter guides, those sorts of things. They will talk about it. They talk about it at church a little bit. They talk about it in conversations outside of church. That's what you're looking at in the various bars here. So we've got sacrament meeting. That's the church meetings that are held on Sundays, virtually no politics. The next is whether the lessons that are taught, do they mention politics? It's a little bit more. How about conversations in church? A little bit more. Conversations outside of church? Sure, there's a lot. And those conversations are largely going to skew in the conservative direction. OK. That lays out the groundwork for what I want to get at. This dry kindling metaphor, drop the match, Mormons get mobilized. When does that happen? When do all those conditions kick in? The fact that they're cohesive and they're distinctive and they have these skills and this experience and getting involved in stuff. When does that matter politically? Well, uh, Quinn Monson and I have published a paper in which we argue that Mormons follow their leaders when two conditions hold. When LDS officials explicitly endorse an issue, they make it clear that it matters to church leadership, and when they present a united front. That is, all the general authorities agree. Now, to contemporary Mormons, the second one seems like kind of a dumb thing to say. Well, of course the general authorities agree, right? Well, they do today, but they didn't in the past. We already heard that. Remember, Jan Schiff's told us that in 1936, Heber J. Grant told Mormons in Utah, don't vote Roosevelt. And what did the Mormons do? They went ahead and voted for Roosevelt. And they did the same thing on prohibition. He said, let's keep prohibition. And Mormons said, eh, let's not. <laughs> but today, of course, it's a different world. And so if, if the church speaks out on a political issue, it does so with a united front. It's important to note, however, that the church only does this, or only has done it in the last 40 or so years on ballot propositions, not on partisan elections. So I'm just going to show you, um, oh, let me back up, one piece of evidence that these things matter. It matters when church leaders speak out on issues. And we're going to actually use a hard example. So on this survey, we did a little experiment. We separated out our respondents randomly. And some got this statement. Some state and local governments have proposed laws to prohibit discrimination in housing and employment based on sexual orientation. Some people oppose this idea because they believe it would show approval of homosexuality. To what extent do you favor or oppose a law to prohibit discrimination in housing and employment based on sexual orientation? Okay. And people could pick their position on a scale of 0 to 100. So you had these two options, and you had a little slider, and you could move it where you thought your opinion was. Then we gave another group, again, randomly sampled, uh, the same information, so they got all the same stuff. But then we added this. In response to the debate on the issue, the church has issued the following. And this is a true statement. We did not make this up. We actually pulled this from a statement out of the LDS Public Affairs Office. Quote, the church believes in human dignity, in treating others with respect, even when we disagree. In fact, especially when we disagree. And then people were asked, do you agree or disagree with this anti-discrimination statute. Okay, does that make sense, how that worked? Okay. Then we gave them a specific statement from the church, again, drawn from church material. The church believes hu human dignity, inhuman dignity, in treating others with respect and in the right of people to have a roof over their heads and the right to work without being discriminated against. So it's a more specific reference to the issue at hand. And the question is, what happens to Mormons' opinions? Right? You would not normally expect a highly conservative group like this to be all that sympathetic to an anti-discrimination statute that deals with homosexuality. That would be our prior. That's what you would expect. Right? But we know the church has actually been involved in this issue, at least in the Salt Lake City um, area. And the church has actually said, no, we're OK with non-discrimination statutes. So we wanted to see, can we move Mormon opinion by telling them that their church has taken a position that you might characterize as more liberal, even, can I say that, than where you'd expect your modal Mormon to be. Here's what happens. The baseline, the first bar, those are people who just are asked, what's your opinion on this issue? Um, and they're about in the middle. So again, there's that moderation that we see. Those who hear the general LDS statement, they're a little more likely to support this law. Okay, But those who hear the specific LDS statement, the one that said, actually, you know what? We don't like discrimination in housing and jobs. Those folks are much more likely to now support the law. The white border signifies that that's a statistically significant difference from the baseline category. Right? In other words, Mormon opinion can move on this issue. And this is a tough case, right? This is a case where people 
are being asked to essentially move against their natural political inclinations. And we see evidence that it works. Now, is this the same thing as saying that these folks would go out and campaign on behalf of this issue? That's a harder thing to say. But I am willing to put forward that the conditions that we describe for the dry kindling to work are potentially operational on multiple issues, not just on the issue of gay marriage. That's not a prediction that we will see them happen often, but it is a prediction that if you were to see LDS leaders speak out on an issue, that they have a lot to work with in the Mormon population. But it's a double-edged sword because use the kindling once and it's extinguished and you have to wait for it to build up again. So my final point, I'll just skip ahead. We had other experiments, but I won't go into them here. Um, let me go back to my initial question. Are Mormons a peculiar people? Well, the answer is yes, but not always in the way you think. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to our presenters who did such a great job of getting us caught up to our proposed timeline. We still have about 10 minutes for questions. And if I could just exert a mo moment of executive privilege, I have a question for you, Phil. Um, just this week, I came across an article that you wrote, I think it was in Religion in American Culture a while ago, about Mitt Romney and your personal interaction with him, which as a very modest person, I noticed you did not bring up here. But you closed your paper today discussing the importance of character in politics, how Romney's character would inform his politics. And because that has been such a point of, well, it's been a problematic point for Romney with some accusations about honesty, about greed, how would you assess his character having served with him in a bishopric many years ago and having known him personally? I'm just curious. Hmm. That sounds like a tender topic. <laughs> we, should, we should mention, just to remind ourselves that I'm sure this audience is not entirely LDS, a bishopric are the three people who lead a ward or a congregation. Yeah, so I was a counselor to Mitt when he was a bishop in uh, Cambridge uh, back in the day. And um, I never saw anything in my personal dealings with him that would separate him from most other Mormon bishops uh, in matters of character, if by character in that question we mean um, integrity, honesty. Character can mean other things, as I tried to suggest in the paper, like um, grit or stubbornness or swimming upstream, um, toughness, adventuresomeness, those sorts of traits. But as far as um, Having integrity, I've been aware of the um, possibility, the observations, the questions, the assertions about uh, Mitt changing his positions over much and not really standing for anything. Um, I have to let him answer for himself as he has uh, in response. Um, I remember especially his grilling by Tim Russert on Meet the Press in the 2008 election and Mitt explained himself, and um, that would be an example in their archives of a, a place to go when, you have a, when the candidate has a full hour to explain himself. But in his private behavior, um, I saw only goodwill and honesty at work. Didn't have any reason to question that. Thank you so much for, um, for letting me indulge that moment. Other questions for our panelists? Yes, Will. Um, well, it's, it's a nationally representative sample, so we did not um, target any particular demographic within the Mormon population. Um, if you want the, I won't go into too much technical detail, but 
in order to survey a small group like this, this was true actually of this big Pew survey that was recently done, you do have to pay some attention to geographic clustering. So there was a, when we were finding the Mormons to interview, we did account for the fact that they happen to be concentrated in the Mountain West, but then when we report the results, we also account for the fact that we took that into account when we first drew the sample. Uh, in other words, what you're looking at is a representative slice of the Mormon population, but, and I will stress this, a self-identified Mormon population. So if you look carefully at the numbers we have, and this is true for the Pew survey and other surveys of Mormons, church attendance rates are reported at astronomically high levels. 70, 75% of these folks say that they attend church on a weekly basis. The members of the LDS Church in the audience are thinking, I'm not sure that 75% of my congregation is showing up every Sunday. And that's because many of the people who we might have on the records of the church would not, and therefore are counted against those attendance statistics within the church, might not identify themselves as Mormon when somebody calls them on the phone or contacts them in some other way and asks for their religion. You did have a pretty broad scope of images. Yes. Yeah, in fact, that's one of the, I mean, this is literally, the, what I say is the first cut, like I, I did this on Tuesday. Um, but age differences are one of the most interesting things we want to look at within the Mormon population, because there are a lot of generational differences. Yes, in the front row. Uh, I just wanted to ask Dr. Campbell, he alluded to the fact that Mormons contribute to such a single atheist racial participation rate in California, that is it a foregone conclusion that Mormons are going to get the highest draw? Is it too early to say, or is it just a given? Um, well, Depends on, so the, the question, if you didn't hear it, was should we expect to see this dry kindling phenomenon occur in support of the Romney candidacy? Um, you would and you wouldn't, okay? So you wouldn't in the sense that what I was describing would be top-down mobilization encouraged by church leadership, like, for example, in the Proposition 8 campaign in California that we'll hear more about from Joanna Brooks. Um, you will not see that done by church leaders on behalf of Mitt Romney. I am willing to go on the record with that one. Um, I, I'd swear, swear on the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, however, those conditions that enable Mormons to be mobilized, that is the fact that they work in these sort of tight-knit congregations and they do lots of stuff together and they feel that they're distinctive and peculiar and all of that. Um, would work to the benefit of others, not church leaders, but others who might want to tap into that energy on behalf of the Romney candidacy. So yes, and I suspect you're going to see that tomorrow in the Nevada caucuses. Lots of Mormons are going to show up, and why is that happening? Because elder scorn presidents and bishops that as local leaders are going to be calling up their friends who are in the church, and et cetera. But that's a very different thing than having the president of the LDS church say, all right, folks, let's mobilize on behalf of Mitt Romney. That's, that's not going to happen. Yes. Um, so you mentioned with the kindling that one of the um, aspects is that you can't constantly mobilize people. So I was wondering, how do you think the church actually goes about choosing the issues that it, that it does in order to mobilize people? It's a good, good question. How does the church choose its issues? I wouldn't claim to. Um, to know what goes on inside the, the meetings or the hearts or the souls of um, the general authorities of the church when they make these decisions. Um, I will say that um, there are a few issues historically that the church has been quite interested in, obviously gay marriage, but even on gay marriage, the church has been very selective. It was actually silent, essentially, in 2004 when there were 13 ballot initiatives on same-sex marriage, including one in the state of Utah church stayed pretty well silent. They did get involved in California, I think, for idiosyncratic reasons. Basically, they felt they could make a difference. Um, they care a lot about gambling. That doesn't get as much attention, but the church has actually, on a number of occasions, worked on ballot initiatives to um, either against gambling or lotteries or those sorts of things. Um, and then going way back, the church has been interested in alcohol policy. I haven't had a ballot proposition on that in a long time, but that has been an issue. And then should, should an immigration issue come up, particularly in states where there's a concentration of Mormons, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one where the church might also get involved. But they'll do so only selectively and carefully. These are pragmatic, strategic people. They don't want to waste their, their resources. We have two questions here in the middle.
expand on that at all? Uh, because just as you said, you, you, you can anticipate great differences between mm -hmm. you know, young people, uh, voting, thinking, and right. Uh, so, so this is my co-author, Bob uh, Putnam. Um, I, I wasn't here to hear what he said, but he and I have written a book together, so I can, I can guess what he was saying, uh, which is that um, among young Americans, this is not young Mormons, but young, among young Americans, you see this very interesting divide. Young Americans, millennials, we usually call them, pro-life on abortion, perfectly fine with gay marriage. So they're moving in opposite directions on the two issues that have united the religious right. It's not actually the same with young Mormons. Uh, so young Mormons are gonna look like all Mormons in general on abortion, right? So generally pro-life with the, they're okay in, the, in the, a couple of exceptions. Um, gay marriage is a little trickier. So on gay marriage, young Mormons, no, they're pretty conservative. On gay rights generally, or sort of attitudes toward homosexuality, you're gonna find a real softening among young Mormons like you would among young millennials. Not to the same extent, right? So just like, Attitudes toward gender roles in the LDS population, you could say, are like 30 years behind or 40 years behind the rest of the country. Young Mormons are probably 10 or 20 years behind their young peers and other religious groups, but still far more sympathetic to gays than their parents or their grandparents. Ever been to an Episcopal church? Can't say that I have. Any Episcopalians in the audience? I'm a Mormon. Is it fair to say that the Episcopalians try to do a lot of political mobilization? It's a pretty political. You may you not know, actually think of the Episcopalians as a terribly political church, but actually they are. Um, how effective would you say Episcopalian political mobilization is? We're not holding conferences fearing the Episcopalians rising up and changing the face of America. Yeah, that's right. They, they, they work from the top. Um, ask any rabbi, they'll tell you the same thing. So synagogues, very politically active. Um, but on any given issue, they would have the same difficulty mobilizing their members that Mormons have getting people to volunteer to come out to the Boy Scout camp. Why? Because they ask about the Boy Scouts all the time. So it kind of takes on a, the flavor of something you can refuse because it happens all the time. Politics, really rare. And so when it happens, it catches the attention. And I think there's a recognition on the part of church leaders that if they did it a lot, not only would it throw their tax-exempt status into question, it would deplete the resource they have. That actually, I'm sorry, uh, you look desperate, Max. Okay, quickly, Max, your question. <laughs> Yeah, well, there, uh, I think that would be an increasing, uh, increasingly interesting or compelling um, series of fractures to explore. So um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Uh, so I just italicize your question. But um, in some ways, um, some of the candidates are to the right of the church. But there is within Mormonism, Mormon culture, partly because of the missionary experience of the world as they send, uh, Mormon families send their young people out around the globe and they uh, come back um, awakened and more sympathetic than they left to the integrity of these cultures that um, 
they come back sometimes and marry someone uh, in the area that they proselytized in. Um, so there's a grassroots part born of experience, and then there's a top-down part um, by abstract principles of the gospel equality of all people. I cited an example from the Book of Mormon of actual scriptures that like all people dealing with all collections of scriptures are selective, but the passages selected evolve during time, and that's in response to cultural awakenings and political moments and things. So I don't have any synthetic grand observation other than to say I think your question's important, and if I were spending a little more time painting that canvas, it would have uh, some fracture lines around. Thank you all. We will reconvene at 2.45 on the dot.